You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Scott, uh, and I'm uh, setting up this broad, broadcast, this podcast, which you might be listening to on either YouTube or uh, on a podcast, on behalf of the INCJ. So welcome to, to this, and it's part of a series on the COVID Leadership Challenge. Um, COVID is pr presenting a unique challenge to people who are on the front line, uh, but also to leaders. And we at INCJ thought it would be particularly interesting to start a conversation for leaders internationally. And so we're talking to them about their experience of the crisis, because often leaders are alone and they don't get a chance to share what's going on. And if you want to follow this series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net and on Twitter at INTCJ Network. And first up in this series, we've got Willem van der Brugge, who's the Secretary General of CEP. And the most important thing, Willem, is to say hi. Tell us where you're sitting, Willem. I'm sitting at home, as many, many people do nowadays. Uh, yeah. Well, I can say uh, just yesterday, uh, things changed in uh, in the Netherlands. We're in the Netherlands. I, I live uh, in Heerenkwaard, which is a city uh, near Alkmaar in the northern Holland, 50 kilometers above Amsterdam, north from Amsterdam. Um, but things changed. Um, we have an increase of numbers of COVID-19 in the Netherlands, as many countries in Europe. So mm -hmm. the advice is now to work from home. Mm -hmm. So I am at home. Well, one of the things we'll do in this series is check out everybody's um, studies and how tidy they okay, are. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so you're doing so okay so far. Um, and I want you to tell us a little bit about CEP. Okay. Um, so how many members do you have and what's the aim of the organization? Okay, let's start with, with, with the aim of the organization. I, th I think CEP, I think you can describe it the best as a network organization. That's mm -hmm. the valuable part. Um, the aim of the organization is to promote social inclusion of offenders and then through alternative sanctions, so community sanctions and measures. Mm -hmm. um, CEP, it's an abbreviation for the Confederation of European Probation, by the way, uh, is committed to enhance the profile of probation uh, and to improve professionalism uh, on a national but also European scale. Um, we, well, you ask how many members we have, um, a bit of a history, because that's important for me. Um, we started in 1981, so next year, 40 years ago, mm. near Paris in an abbey. At that time, we spoke about Western Europe. So there were 10 Western European countries at that meeting in Paris, talking about the establishment of the Confederation of European Probation which had a French name, by the way, then. Mm -hmm. um, the initiative was taken, I think, by the Dutch, and uh, because uh, those, those Western European countries were worried about the situation of uh, the conditions of foreign national offenders in Europe, all over Europe. And they thought, we could, as, as 10 Western European countries together, we can solve that problem. Well, you and I know mm. we didn't. Uh, but they start organizing workshops, meetings, uh, they um, exchange reports, things like that. And remember, there was no internet or online meetings like this. It was mm -hmm. physical and, and reports were sent by post. There was no, there was no email. Well, uh, Europe changed over the years. Uh, important to know is 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, let's say from the year 2000, former Eastern and Central European countries became member of CE. Mm -hmm. And I think nowadays we have something like 45 full member organizations who provide probation activities. 
representing 37 countries in Europe. Uh, and we have um, individual members, also universities who are members, branch organizations who are members. Um, and next year, 2021, we hope to be in Paris again, celebrating our 40th anniversary. Important for CP is that we bring together uh, those members uh, by organizing, still organizing conferences and workshops and seminars, expert group, summer course, uh, and publishing articles and news uh, on, on the CP website and in its newsletter. Um, the office is in Utrecht, in the middle of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the Secretary General. We have four staff members and we have an international board. Mm. Now, in all that long history, you've never had anything like this happen. No. So what sort of changes have you had to make to CEP because of COVID-19? <laughs> I end it by saying uh, the, the, like the last question that we organize all kinds of meetings and conferences. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing we had to do um, is postpone or cancel all those scheduled events. Yeah. First, we were a bit optimistic, but no, we were realistic. We said, okay, it started half March. Um, till summer, there will be no events. So we canceled uh, some conferences and uh, uh, some small meetings, but then uh, due course of time, it became clear that it would take longer. Mm. And for now, we have canceled all events for the rest of the year. I think the first, let's say, physical event will be in April next year. So that's quite something. So we had to organize, uh, uh, and that was a lot of work, as you can imagine, because that's our daily work and, and, and uh, is it postponing or cancelling? What do you have to do? Contacts with venues, contact with speakers. Um, of course, you had to organize and manage your staff in a different way. Mm -hmm. On one side, you could say, see, is very used to working on a distance. I, I, I travel a lot. Um, well, let's say in the old normal. Yeah. I make 40 travels a year. So I'm, I'm, I'm away, let's say, 80 days a year. So I was used by working on distance and managing my staff on distance. And they, uh, they can do that. They can manage that. But it's something different, of course. You have to mm. work on a different way. Um, uh, and we had to extend, and that was very important, the online communication. I think that's the most important part at the moment. How do you communicate with your members? Mm. Uh, that is very important. So what we started doing, what we thought was relevant uh, what immediately, was collecting all the protocols uh, from national and European uh, bodies regarding uh, how they deal with, with the COVID-19. Um, and that worked out very well. We collected something like 38 protocols. And what we noticed that, that, that uh, several jurisdictions were very keen on that, saying, uh, uh, what do other jurisdictions do? How do they mm. organize things regarding contacts with service users? How do they manage their staff? Mm. Uh, contacts with the court, uh, the media, whatever, the MOJ. How do you organize such things? So there was a lot of exchange. And so they came, they came to you to find out what other countries were doing. Yeah. And which was quite remarkable. Also the commission, European commission, because we are... Uh, how do you say that? More lenient, we are more flexible. We can do that much, much quicker than the European Commission can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is very much appreciated. And then we start collecting, which I think I, I find it very nice, was stories of okay. uh, service providers. Actually, uh, uh, our, our let's say our, our uh, professionals who. Uh, do the daily activities, who provide the daily activities. Mm -hmm. How do they manage their meetings with clients? Okay, so, uh, so tell, t t give, me an, give me an illustration. So uh, this is an ordin ordinary probation officers having to be creative. Well, literally people were working from the kitchen table. <laughs> right. And, uh, bit, bit, bit like us, you mean, with a coffee. Yeah, no, that's everywhere the same. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah, and having difficulties uh, with, for instance, high-risk offenders. How do you keep in contact with them? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's also well that, that that's everywhere the same. That you hear everywhere the same stories. How difficult it is if your children are at home too. You have to raise a family too, mm-hmm. and um, so that's difficult. And um, um, not all in all jurisdiction. Let's say that there was a digital infrastructure. So it is quite a challenge for people, um, and some of them were very creative. Uh, on that, how they kept in contact with people. They, they, they spoke them somewhere else. I will give an example later, mm-hmm. uh, which I think was very innovative. Okay. Um, but I, I, we collected all those stories. And um, uh, you mentioned Twitter in the beginning. We noticed that those stories were very popular. Some of them were uh, downloaded more than 4,000 times, which is a lot. Okay. Um, Europe, yeah. And do you think that those illustrations of practice were downloaded by ordinary probation officers so they could find out what their colleagues were doing. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's a yeah. good use of the new technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, yeah, and that, that's more, of course, eh, because I said, uh, uh, but what we noticed also is um, uh, we, we, uh, brought, we published a special newsletter on the COVID-19. Okay. Uh, um, all the protocols, and we published one on uh, uh, domestic violence because everywhere you uh, uh, get signals that domestic violence cases uh, are rising because of people had to stay at home, yeah. and especially, uh, let's say, the service users, uh, let's say our clients mm-hmm. are not the most, um, how do you say that, easy people to deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, we published a newsletter on domestic violence too. And um, what we could notice, I mentioned that already, that social media was booming. People uh, uh, kept in, uh, keep in touch, kept in touch on another way, in another way, via uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, mm-hmm. name it, name it. Yeah. Okay. And of so, course, what we did, John, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, no, it's okay. It, keep going. It's okay is that, of course, we start organizing online events um, instead of the physical meetings. We organized a director general's meeting of two hours, uh, just talking about how it is to deal uh, with, with COVID-19. Mm. And that was very much appreciated. Uh, and we will uh, uh, give that a follow-up um, the end of October. And we organized a webinar and all expert meetings we're, are online now for the rest of the year. Okay. Well, it, sound, it sounds to me that um, CEP has had to be quite fast moving to, and you've put material out and that's that's how, you, how you've responded. What do you think has been the biggest challenges for you as a leader of CEP? For me, I think that is uh, uh, to keep the network working. Okay. Yeah. To yeah, yeah. bringing people together as we used to do, and to maintain all the contacts that we have, to. that is the most challenging thing. Do you think people have missed um, meeting face to face? Oh yes, yes, yes. You get all kinds of messages now. Uh, okay, it was nice to see you. For instance, when you organize an expert meeting, you get a uh, thanks uh, mail afterwards, and people were saying uh, something like. Uh, it was very nice to see you again. I hope the next meeting will be physical again. <laughs> um, and I noticed it myself. Recently, I was in Brussels and I was in Strasbourg. And then I noticed how much I missed the context when you actually meet the people there. Yeah. yeah. Do you think the work's as good on uh, virtual meetings? Do you think the quality of the work is as good? It depends, depends. Uh, there are things that you say, okay, this is uh, uh, really, we have to uh, uh, remember, uh, or, or how do you say that? Um, when you have, for instance, when you have a, a presidium meeting, yeah, mm. when yeah. you do that uh, one day, a one day meeting, but that's a meeting which you can easily do online with five people for two or three hours. Mm. It saves a lot of time. Yeah. 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 And then the next time you can say, okay, we can organize uh, another meeting with a dinner or whatever, with a, social, a bit more social uh, contact. 
than let's say the the, the, the business context that you have. Okay. One of the things I, I mean, I'm interested to ask you about is that you and I know each other for a long time, and it, this feels very easy to chat like this, but it's making new contacts which might be a bit harder virtually and, and maybe reaching out. Have you found over the last six months that getting new relationships going has been harder or are people learning how to do that as well virtually? They're, they're learning. Most, most people are learning fast how to do yeah, that. What I do thing. now, uh, for instance, in the past, you, uh, for instance, if you look for um, uh, a presenter for a conference, um, to send him or her an email, yeah, mm -hmm. you say we'll meet, blah blah blah. Uh, now you organize a meeting like this. Yeah, say okay, it's good to chat. Uh, also with old contacts, that that's new. Yeah, that you say okay, we have to meet in another way to get in contact. But what is good to know that uh, I think we um, over the last few months, uh, um, I think we have four or five new members. Okay, so. So maybe people are reaching out and learning how to make new relationships virtually as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. Right, I want to change the focus a little bit and um, look at some of the negatives of COVID-19 because you've, you've been quite upbeat. But my guess is that um, probation services around uh, your, your members, are, are many of them are under real pressure. Yeah. Be financial, we've talked about the real worries they might have in supervising dangerous offenders or offenders who may be victims themselves of either violence or are struggling with mental health or other other issues. And I wonder what worries your, your probation members have brought to you about the impact of COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, maybe on their budgets or, or what so what worries are out there in the system about Well, COVID? of course, it's on different levels. Um, um, I think the, the main concern is how to organize the contact, the meetings with the service users. Got it, yeah. That is their, their main concern. How do you organize that? And then especially with high-risk offenders. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine that. And then it's also how to manage an organization when the offices are actually closed. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? And then... Uh, what they had to organize is if we're properly with or even implement a digital infrastructure. What I noticed that in some jurisdiction, there is no, was no digital infrastructure or it was not used. In countries where it was used, uh, for instance, like in, in, the, in the Netherlands, everybody could log in from home on the system. Mm. So everybody could work from home, had done it before. So within a week, everything was arranged. But that was not the case in every juris uh, other jurisdiction, especially small jurisdiction. Mm. When you're, let's say, everybody lives 30 kilometers from the office, why mm. should you have a digital infrastructure if you could go to the office every day? And um, that is, uh, was one of the worries. Then another worry was the, the, the pressure on the caseload. I shall explain that. Mm -hmm. As you noticed, I've, I think it has been in the UK the case too, that... Uh, there were many pre-releases from prison. Uh, I've heard it from many jurisdictions. People were sent uh, uh, home with or without electronic monitoring and probation supervision. Yeah. But without extending the probation staff, of course. Um, the positive thing about that is that there was no race of uh, uh, criminal offences in, in, in many jurisdictions. So now they're more or less saying, okay, perhaps we can do without um, um, so many prisons. We have to, we, we can do with less prisons, who knows? But pressure on the caseload, that's one. And then the, the, what we hear a, a bit later was the backlog of daily probation work, which is now the case. And then think of all those community services, uh, yeah, who are not executed. Um, only in the Netherlands, 10,000 are waiting. So this is cases not allocated and yeah. hours of offenders have to work in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the hours uh, of I think that's, that's the case in, 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 
in the UK too, in England and Wales too. Yeah. Uh, uh, lots of people on the community uh, centers is were working uh, uh, in an elderly home or something like that. Okay, yeah, right. Not done at the moment, of course. Mm. So how do you manage that? Uh, the same for pre-sentence reports. Mm. Um, lots of jurisdictions, probation rights uh, draft pre-sentence reports, but the courts were closed too. So there okay. was... Um, so that's a, that's a problem for justice, isn't it? And that's presumably um, a problem right across all your membership. Yeah, that there's yeah. this yeah. mountain. Well, I think our next di director general's meeting will be about this topic. Okay. How do you start up an organisation again? How do you deal with the the MOJ about this, and also the judiciary uh, on on those backlogs? Yeah. And, 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 and can I just pause you yeah. a moment there, Willem? Because um, the backlog exists now and we're talking at the end of september and as we understand it um across your membership across the whole of europe um cases are rising again um new measures are being taken new reg regulations pretty well uh, all countries are tightening up again so that backlog is likely to get worse and worse over winter isn't it yeah so this is a problem that's only going to get bigger for the justice system. Yeah. So that, if we, if, we, if we go back to um, what worries a probation manager's having to face, leaders are having to face, it's that worry about backlogs, and that presumably creates real pressures on their staff. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Of course, it's, it's not the, the, the problem of the staff itself, uh, because they deal with individual cases. Mm. But what they see, the, the, the signals I get, is, is uh, uh, um, uh, an increasing number of cases with mental health problems or domestic violent cases. That's, okay. let's say, more on, on, the, on the content of the cases. Okay. What is going on? Have things changed when you have to deal with your service users? Yes, yes. Okay. That is what uh, professionals tell me. Okay. Yeah. Right. And... I'm thinking maybe that the long-term pressures that might come out of increased unemployment um, and those mental health issues will make real demands on probation services um, across Europe. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And okay. Yeah. But then on the long term is, of course, is what everybody say is uh, how you're saying that is how to keep society safe. Yeah. In general. Um, um, it's the contact with the media I think that's very important too and you mentioned the budget we don't know what will happen of course in, in general mm. with, with the budget of all probation organizations um, if you compare it of course to prison it's relatively even cheap mm. uh, but still you don't know you don't know what will happen well I, I, I'm really interested because obviously people think about health um, being in the front line and social provision, justice provision also in the front line. And as the COVID crisis continues, it feels like a grinding sort of crisis. And um, I think leaders are caught up in that. Shall we just before we move on to other other topics? I just want to ask. You, you mentioned earlier that you've got illustrations of uh, yeah. innovative ways. I'm really keen to perhaps move into ways in which you're you've heard about creative ways uh, that probation staff have responded to this crisis. But perhaps to, to raise us uh, in, in general, of course, that's the use of video platforms. Yeah, yeah. But also in court sessions. Okay, so, tell me about that. that. It's quite new. It. There, there were, of course, experiments on that, but you see that it becomes more, I cannot say casual, but okay. you can say, okay, people start thinking, okay, perhaps this is the way to organize things. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a story on, on, on the website on this. Um, what I uh, um, noticed was also, there are some apps which you can download on your phone. Mm -hmm supportive apps for offenders. Um, I think the most famous one is uh, Changing Lives from uh, the Probation Board of Northern Ireland, PBNI. And what they noticed was an increase of people who downloaded the app and wanted contact with their probation officer. 
So it's not control. It's on a voluntary base. People need the structure of an app. It's a calendar and uh, it's do's and don'ts and news. And um, But I, I, I like that very much. I find that very positive. Yeah. And then the last one is uh, perhaps the nicest one. It's mm -hmm. the creativity of individuals. Okay. Um, the best read uh, uh, story of a professional uh, over the last uh, six months was a story of uh, a Dutchman called Frans. Uh -huh. And uh, he organized uh, um, uh, walking uh, for, for, for offenders. He was a walking coach. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> instead of uh, organizing meetings, he walked with the offenders, with the service user, alongside the beach or through the polder, uh, because we're in the Netherlands. Yeah. And he had a waiting list. Fantastic. Uh, yes, and I like that very much. Yeah, I yeah. do too. I, if you can't meet at the office, meet people outside. Well, and also, um, if you, it's a bit like we're trying to have a proper conversation. You have you can have really good chats with people while you're walking alongside, as yeah. long as you're socially distancing. Yeah. What walking therapy sounds great to me. Walking supervision, it's a yeah. it's a great idea. I'm going to move. Um, focus a little bit away from the organization okay uh, and maybe um uh i want to talk about you a bit okay um uh it's a it's, it, we're talking about leaders and you're a leader and you've been in leadership management for a long time has anything about the last six months made you rethink your approach to work yeah but that's i think just in not in general to my work i still think it's very important and mm -hmm. I like it very much, um, but it, in general, it's of course the rel relativity of things we do, uh, also of uh, um, yeah, and the vulnerability of our society. I think that that, mm. that is what you see, and how to keep your staff motivated and together. You have to organize that in another way. That is made me think of okay, how do you do that? You have to invest in that. It's such a different way of working. Um, I remember how glad we were uh, that we could meet, I think it was beginning of June, just informal, we had an informal meeting in the garden of one of our uh, staff members. I was there in the neighborhood, so the others came, and how glad we were that we could mm. meet physically, although we were in contact like this. Mm. That was good that we could see and each other and everybody was in good health. Uh, such things have become very important. Mm. Yeah. Do you think CEP will go back to the way it was? Do you think uh, you'll? Yeah, in in a, in a way, uh, I, I hope that we'll get back to how it was once was, uh, because as I said earlier, uh, uh, more and more we receive signals from member how they miss CEP and the <laughs> contacts with the other members. Mm. But some things will stay. Mm. I think more online meetings as we have now. Yeah. yeah? I think we will do that in the future too. We okay. did it in the past, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for instance, it's easier. I can give you an example. We organize a, uh, a mental health expert meeting online, and I already have a topic for a second one. I said, okay, why not offer the group to do that online? It's a small investment. But people don't have to travel. So. Mm. Uh, well, it's also greener, isn't it? If fewer people are jumping on it's airplanes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it is interesting. It's the magic of being together um, can really raise commitment, but also, what can you could say, waste a lot of time. So it's that getting yeah. the balance. On right. the other hand, what we noticed, uh, as, as you know, every, every two years we organize a conference uh, on the use of electronic monitoring. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. We had to postpone it uh, uh, for a year. Yeah. And um, still we have a growing number of registrations. People like to come mm. and to meet. Yeah. So the commitment hasn't gone down to the organization. No. Um, actually, people are finding out what they're missing about you. About you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, has lockdown changed you as a person at all? Uh, I, can't, I can't say no. But I, I, I don't think so, yes. But uh, of course, of course, I, I think that's for, for you too. It makes you think how vulnerable 
uh, society is and things mm. are, and of course family values, mm. how important that is, and, yeah. and uh, health of, of friends and relatives, how important you think that is. Yeah. Um, context, uh, well, with your gra- grandchildren. Yeah, I, and you can't hug them. It seems really weird, doesn't it? Yeah, that's that's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, have you got a book to recommend? What's the best book Ooh, you've read? The best book? Yeah, that's a story. I, I, in March, I started uh, with a book of one of my favorite authors. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's called Ferdinand Bernard Hotz, but it was called Troubled Times. <laughs> right, good title. <laughs> Immediately, I stopped reading. <laughs> so it made me think what is the, uh, has been the most important book or influential book in my life. And I found one, Yeah, easy. It's called The Office. Okay. It's uh, a seven books. It's 5,000 pages. <laughs> 5,000? 5, 5,000 pages. And it's a series of novels mm. about uh, of the, uh, a Dutch author called Foskow, which means foxhole. Mm. And um, he describes very in detail the day-to-day affairs of an office-based in Amsterdam, mm-hmm. and uh, the office is called the Meertens Institute. It has now a different name, I think. It's a research institute that focuses on the study of documentation of Dutch language and culture. Yeah. <laughs> and central in that book are phenomena that shape everyday life in our society. Mm-hmm. Uh, he describes it as scientific research into trivialities, like, for instance, this, how uh, sorts of brats was spread all over the Netherlands. Now, is, it, is this translated into English or I other languages? So. I think so, yes. Well, yes. this is your recommendation. You will, you will recognize it. You will recognize it, all those stories. One okay. of the storylines is, it's also a radio play, by the way. Okay. And uh, um, last but not least, I visited that office. Okay. But I, I promised you I should tell you a story about coffee. Okay, go on. One storyline is about coffee which, as we know, uh, well, we have a national brand here, Dauwe yeah. Egbers, which yes, is, yes. is great coffee. It's great coffee. But it's also the time he describes 30 years of working at that office when fair trade coffee became popular. And the, uh, the head person, uh, the, the author, he wants to introduce uh, uh, fair trade coffee, which is yeah. a different brand. Of course. But the concierge, he refused to buy that. And they suspect him that he collects the royalty points uh, of the, the coffee. Yeah, okay. you get royalty. Oh, I see. Points. By yeah, sticking yeah. to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, it's, it's brought to the management team. The coffee is brought as a, as a topic to discuss in the management team. And they thought it was so important, they uh, brought it to the board. So a board decision was <laughs> taken. Only in Holland. Yes, that, that they should use fair trade coffee. But still, the, the concierge refuses to buy <laughs> <laughs> the fair trade coffee. And uh, the main character, uh, in the end, he buys the coffee himself. That's a commitment to... Uh, These are all stories which have... To real, to real values in yeah. spite of the, uh, of the culture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's one of my favorite books. It, 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 yeah. 5,000 5, pages. It would keep you quiet for the rest of lockdown, I should think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the things about a challenge is that um, we're going to be passing this challenge to other people. Um, have you any hard, any questions from this COVID experience that you're still working at that's sort of an, like an open question that you want to put to me or to other people? What I think is important is, is um, I should... My open question is, yeah, yeah, we have to tell our story to the media and to our stakeholders, to everybody. It's, it's about creating public value. How do you create public value as an organization? I think that is my main question. Um, wow. I, I, yeah, how do you do that as an organization? Because it's so important. Um, That's, I mean, that that is a really good question because... I think we find that uh, as a probation service or as a criminal justice system, we find that hard in ordinary times, 
And at the moment, the attention is, let's say, on health risk or at the moment, uh, students going back to college are a big issue. I think all over Europe, people are worried about students going away and having a very bad experience of, uh, of back, going back to university rather than that being an exciting time. It's a time when they're worried about their health and you know not being able to mix and having a great time making new friends. Um, so getting stories about criminal justice and what our staff are doing. So that your challenge is telling stories and how to create public value. Yeah, and that should be my, be my advice to, to, to all people. Okay. Tell yeah. your story, tell your story to the media, tell your story to others. Because um, okay. I always say, if you ask a five-year-old child, what is your grandchildren? What is a prison? Well, mm -hmm. that's easy. It's a big building with towers mm. and, 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 and uh, uh, with bars and you can't get out in cells. But mm. if you ask them, what is probation? That is so difficult to tell. So we have to keep on telling our stories. What our contribution is to safer society, how we organize that. Mm. Um, tell your story. Tell your story. What, that is a really brilliant advice. And I think that that's exactly where we'll sign off, Willem. Okay. So thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, I'll finish my coffee. I think you've finished yours. Yeah. I suspect yours was better than mine because yours was Dutch. And I'd like, to say, uh, I'd like to say to everybody, thanks for listening or for watching. Um, please stay safe out there. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, um, come and listen to the next one. We're going to be visiting leaders across the criminal justice system, police, prisons, people working with victims in restorative justice and across different countries like today. And um, thanks for being there. I'm going to say goodbye from Willem and from me, John Scott. Thanks for being there. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.